this series, we want to use five systems variously selected from the schools of mythological tradition as indicative of levels of mythology. Therefore, each one of our discussions will be more or less comparative, but will emphasize the group uh, under which the lesson is uh, titled. So this evening we are going to discuss, in general, uh, Babylonian creation myths. In particular, however, we want to lay down the foundation for a certain comparative study of world mythology. And as this is the only lesson we have set aside for creation stories, we must skip around a bit and hope that you will have the patience to realize that we want to cover as large an area as possible. In the beginning, we want to have something to say about the creation myth as a phase of human thought and human research. Every nation of importance has attempted to describe the origin of itself and to trace into the remote past the foundations of its religious and cultural institutions. For the most part, we come across something that mythologists have not emphasized, but which we must pause to consider. And this is especially true in the Babylonian group, but almost equally obvious in many other systems. Namely, that our creation account is nearly always twofold. There are two distinct stories usually in some conflict and about which a great deal of reconciliation has been attempted. We know, for example, in the Babylonian that we have two distinct layers or levels of creation myths. One comparatively ancient and the other comparatively recent. When I say comparatively recent, I mean probably not over 3,500 to 4,000 years old. The older group being of much earlier development. These groups are gradually reconciled and uh, interpreted until they meet. But there is no basic essential meeting of original ideas. Why should this be true? Perhaps the answer lies in the fact that man is a conscious of creation on two levels of existence. When you study the Vedas, or most of the sacred books of the ancient world, you realize that the authors were heavily indebted to the symbolism of generation, of human generation, and the development of their concepts of cosmogony. In the Eastern system, that practically the entire story of the formation of the universe is based upon the prenatal development of the human fetus. And in various ways, the development and unfoldment of the world is regarded as merely the cosmic equivalent of the unfolding of the human being. On this ground, therefore, creation is a physical thing, arising from physical processes and, to a measure, symbolized by the physical changes and modifications which accompany the, creative, the creativity of growth. There is also a second line of creation thinking, and that is psychological. If man, observing around him, finds that other things were created by generation. He then searches within himself for his own origin, 
and finds not a physical source, but a more or less mystical source, a transcendent source, lying within the locked treasure house of consciousness. Man searching for the origin of himself, therefore, passes gradually backward through the conscious, subconscious, and finally to the unconscious strata of his own psychic organism. A man within himself experiences the elaborate mythology of creation quite differently from the form which he imposes upon the outside formation of things by material generation. Gradually, of course, he externalizes his own internal instincts, and he invests the generative processes with their psychological overtones, but certain conflicts remain. Also, the psychological creation is usually earlier and more profound than the physical creation. Because man possessing certain imaginative faculties within his own consciousness is able to conceive of processes far more abstract than he can observe. Thus internal conception is balanced against external observation. And we have a conceptual universe and an observed universe. And these polarities have existed throughout the study, the development of human thought. Man searching for beginning has always been more or less burdened with difficulty. It is very hard for the human mind to conceive the total absence of a created state. And so we are not surprised that some have taken the rather bold attitude that creation was the formation of something from nothing. This, however, was not a satisfactory interpretation. It did not meet the full need of the growing mind. It seemed wiser then, man speculating upon the mystery of life, to assume that prior to existence as it was conceivable to him, there was something. And in the Greek and in the Babylonian and in the Egyptian philosophies, efforts to determine this pre-existing eternal condition or something took on relations to elements. Some held that fire was the eternal element and the root of all things and that everything came from fire. Others, like Thales, held water to be the sovereignty and that everything came originally from water. There were some who claimed air to be the parent of all elements and still others earth. But in the course of time, the belief in the parenthood of fire and the parenthood of water took domination over the other two elements. And nearly all philosophical systems have been based upon the belief that either fire or water was the primordial substance of the world. Now, isn't it rather interesting that two extreme elements should be thus contrasted, and that in many instances the universal theory was based upon a compromise or a relationship of these two, as is the alchemistical problem of the production of the stone, or the wise man symbol, which was said by these alchemists to be the result of fire burning in water and water feeding the flame of fire. Now if by water we can conceive, as perhaps we should, uh, the material generational concept of life, 
all light, all form, all worlds arising from a kind of amniotic fluid in space, we can have what might be termed man's generation concept based upon things observed or noted in the physical world. Generation from fire, on the other hand, suggests a more attenuated and spiritous essence. Fire seems to imply the creation of things from an invisible sources rather than from visible ones. And uh, through the study of these things, uh, particularly in the light of more modern psychological thinking, fire seems to come to suggest the consideration of creation psychologically or as emerging from the internal life consciousness of man himself. So a creation and vision for man's psychic life is likely to be a fire creation, one envisioned more primitively from his material life may be a water creation. And we have these, again, carrying on through religion, where we have fire cults and water cults uh, powerfully represented. The fire on the altar, the water of purification, it became in turn and time the symbol of spirit and body, or soul and form, or the internal and the external life of man. So man conceived of the spiritual world of which he was a part originating in fire, and the material world or universe which he inhabited originating in water. And from the union of these, the spiritual and the material, he recognized the rise of his own psychic life or the emergence of all compound natures, bodies, processes which have become familiar to him. The Babylonians and uh, peoples of this area have a number of very interesting contributions to make to the cosmological thinking of the world. At a comparatively early date, probably even before the time of Sargon, approximately 3800 BC, we find the rise of a great Semite culture in the Babylonian area. We know that this culture will finally flower nearly a little more than a thousand years later in the rise of Hammurabi and the integration of the great Babylonian Empire. Thus we have many foreign elements to consider in the integration of their religious beliefs. But also, we must recognize that nearly all faiths in surrounding areas are indebted to the religions of Nineveh and Babylon, and that these later influenced Egypt, Greece, and Persia, and that altogether the great Akkad culture has made a very important a contribution to our Bible and to the general knowledge of religious matters in Christendom and in the Judistic worlds. So these things become very intriguing and very important to us. And we will then start with the basic problem that we have to face in all creation accounts. And that is an approach to the state of existence prior to creation. What in the Babylonian concept preceded the great motions which produced the world? Actually and obviously, uh, there could not be too much dogmatizing on this subject, for man has never been able to develop a complete exposition of the state of the universe prior to objectivity. Like nearly all ancient peoples, however, the Babylonians assumed a polarized existence in the sense 
that the state of things prior to creation would be measured by a state opposite to the created state. If there were worlds in creation, there were no worlds prior to creation. If there was a certain organization present in the manifested universe, it would be absent in the non-manifested. So that the prior condition was without the conditions which later emerged from it, but possessed the potential or the possibility of causing conditions to emerge from its own nature. Thus in the Babylonian, as in the Chaldean later and the early Kabbalistic, that which preceded being was no being, not an absence of existence, but an absence of definable manifestation. Eternity encloses, includes, and possesses time, but time can never encompass eternity. Time exists within eternity. And when time fails or dies, eternity returns to its own manifestation. The same with being. All beings exist within a total state. This total state, being undifferentiated, is beyond analysis. <coughs> Yet this state must precede all others and must ultimately survive all conditioned forms of existence. This total being must contain within itself all that is manifested during a process of creation. Yet, it does not come into total manifestation in anything. For total being can become manifested only in total existence. And total existence is as inconceivable to us as Sankraniathon points out, as total lack of existence. All manifestation and no manifestation cannot be distinguished because the human being is incapable of the experiences of totality, either plus or minus. Thus man lives in a condition of partial manifestation. He measures all things partially, not completely. The Babylonians attempted to differentiate the condition that preceded being, and they came to the same concept that was later to be enclosed or captured within the Chaldean oracles of the Zoroasters, namely the thrice deep darkness. Eternity as this and abyss, as Bimi calls it, nothing and all. Something infinitely profound, infinitely eternal and existing, yet containing no measuring or marks by means of which it can be explored, defined, or captured by the mind or even by the consciousness itself. How then do you suppose the concept came into being or came into existence? Almost certainly through man's contemplation of the mystery of sleep. In other words, he has an objective awareness and he has a subjective state which have, in which in normal cases he is unaware of. He passes from a state of objective function to a state of non-knowing. In infancy, he emerges from a state of non-knowing. In the senility of age, of age or of advanced years, he may return gradually to the childishness and infancy of not knowing. So wherever man extend his extremities beyond the boundaries of his normal functions, he approaches not knowing. Now the Chaldean and Babylonian was perfectly justified in assuming that the knowing can come from the not knowing. 
because it does so with every infant that is born. Gradually, from a condition which seems to be the lack or absence of qualities, these qualities gradually manifest themselves. Again, searching in his own experience for the answer to these things, the individual perhaps experiences dreams in which from within himself he becomes aware of an internal world or life that is entirely separate from the external. And this internal life exists in a strange, dark, mysterious world which can be entered only through sleep. We speak of the unconscious, the ancients spoke of the underworld. And he considered this underworld the abode of phantoms, much as we consider the unconscious to be the abode of psychological phantoms. In both cases, the term under is implied, a term which represents below the threshold. And the term threshold becomes very important in Babylonian thinking because they established a clear concept of threshold between the levels of the worlds and place doors and doorkeepers there to guard the various planes or abodes of life. So we have in this basic thinking a state which precedes awaking, which precedes the dawning life consciousness of infancy, which precedes knowing and yet is the root of knowing. Thus, in the Babylonian concept, uh, we come to a belief or an idea that reposing within the infinite nature of this darkness, this inevitable uncondition, there were three duads or polarized beings that rested and continued and endured through all time and eternity and that periodically these beings seem to waken seem to move from subjectivity to objectivity and as a result brought creation into existence as an emphasis as a polarization within themselves the Babylonians did not go as far as the Hindus in this thinking. They did not actually say that creation was the awaking of these gods. But they implied that creation was the manifesting of the will of these, of these polarized pairs of beings who caused to emerge from the eternal the roots and substances of existence. Now their philosophy comes back to us in the orphics and in nearly all be in nearly all religions where you have an anthropomorphic or polarized concept of existence. The eternal unconditioned profundity uh, caused a polarization to occur within itself and this polarization became the abstract potential of opposites although these opposites themselves did not have any factual existence at this remote time as the Greeks had ether and chaos to strive together so the Babylonians and Chaldeans conceived of a striving opposition. Two qualities in stress one with the other. And this stress appears to be the old familiar pair that we just mentioned, namely the stress between an internal psychological creation and an external environmental and material creation. Thus, the stress arises as a, at first as a polarization between internal and external, a polarization between subconscious and conscious. And this polarization took place within the substance of the unconscious. 
So these primordial triad of the Babylonians was essentially unconscious, subconscious, and conscious. And uh, the unconscious remained and must always remain unchanged. And the subconscious and the conscious uh, became polarized within it, the subconscious leading to a motion of life from within energy and out into form, and the conscious leading to a reaction or the gaining of experience or knowledge from living, from environmental association. Thus the universe consisted of two pol polarized powers operating upon each other. A power of withinness and a power of withoutness or outsideness. And everything that exists was, exist, was molded either from within or from without. And in many instances both procedures were identically occurring so that we have beings growing inwardly and at the same time being conditioned outwardly. Now the primary, the primordial form of this being that came out of the abyss is without very much clear definition even in the Babylonian consciousness. Perhaps it is very much like the uh, being we find in the Scandinavian mythologies, the giant Emer, who is formed of the strivings of the frost giants and the flame giants in their great abyss or the great mysterious cosmic uterus called Genungaga, or the cleft in space in which life and manifestation must take place. Now this formation of a strange primordial giant, a giant of potential force striving and eternally existing, seems to tell us that gradually subjectivity was objectified, probably in its earliest and most natural form, as a complete chaos of elements as the invisible defied analysis, so the visible in its primordial form also defied analysis. It was a mass of unconditioned, undirected energies and forces. And it lay long in space, sleeping a mysterious mythical monster and it remained unsold or without life within it except this strange seething collective life of total being and this was the shadow this was that which was the objectification of the deep it was primordial ignorance arising from the totality of primordial unknowing. Now we have to study these thoughts rather carefully because they function on so many levels simultaneously. It would be very easy to confuse them. Man did not conceive of space, total space, as having a mind. He considered it as having merely a total existence. When this space objectified into the total material concept of space, it also was without a mind, but with an existence or a subsistence, second only to the duration of eternity itself. The only difference between spirit and matter then, in this conception, is that matter was destructible because it could be returned again to its own primordial source, whereas spirit or being could not, because it was still that source itself. So the universe passed into a series of conditioned states. 
And in these conditioned states, gradually the objectification of the world began. It began as a series of strange, mysterious pressures, motions, impulses, surging and seething within being itself, and so abstract and so total that even the greatest mythologist did not dare to give it any very tangible definition. He did not even dare to name it. He merely implied that it had always been there. Now this primordial space element began gradually to seem or to become real as the first conditioned existence. It was the first apperceivable state. Man cannot perceive the unconditioned but he can perceive the condition. So with the coming of condition, universality died in the experience of man, and man psychologically transferred his attention to that which he could understand or conceive, with the result that the ancient way, the original material, the base of being, faded from his consciousness to remain always known and recognized only through its symbolism in man, his own total unconscious. But this conditioned being in the Chaldean state, which was a primordial chaos, became known as the Elos, as uh, Berosus tells us. It was the primordial slime. It was this same primordial substance uh, that the, in the Indian philosophy is churned in the early avatars of Vishnu. This strange, mysterious mud, the slime, the base of our word helium, which is the ancient name for the city of Troy. This primordial mud or ooze was the great mother of all living. And way back in those days, man had begun to sense uh, what was later to be more or less demonstrated, namely that all forms came out of water, and that all the organisms that were to come forth and become living creatures upon the earth, have their roots and beginnings in a primordial ooze or slime, a humid, a humid earthy condition, a confused earth water mass, and that from this gradually came the beginnings of monsters. Now on the psychological level, the helium or the illus, the slime, became associated with the human subconscious, differentiated out of the total unconscious of man's existence. This strange ooze was the mother of imagination and fantasy, and it was from this internal strangeness that the first rudimentary dreams or nightmares of human consciousness began. So all human thought, all consciousness, all sensory and faculty differentiation, all ways of knowing and feeling which man has came from a primordial kind of sensing, a mysterious confusion of thought and emotion <coughs> prior to the individualization of either, so that somewhere there was a strange common denominator of man's psychic origin, and this was the, the mud, the elus of the true subconscious root of conscious knowledge. From this subconscious came forth many different types of beings and creatures, and in the Kabbalistic and Chaldean Babylonian theology, it is said that from this slime or ooze there came forth a phantasmagoria of creatures. 
incredible monsters that uh, have no resemblance to the creatures we know in the world today. Composita of various kinds, human beings with the heads of horses, men with the legs and tails of scorpions, human beings with the heads and wings of birds, <coughs> great flying monsters, crawling things with wings like griffins, innumerable, incredible creatures with many heads and many arms and many legs. All of these monstrosities crawling out of the mud, which was the common uterus of matter, and a fantastic concept of lives and forms that were before the beginning. Now out of this also there emerged from within man himself, from the subconscious illus of his psychic mystery of slime, mud, there crawled forth the beginnings and rudiments of man's psychic pressures and tensions, his various forms of awareness, his psychological ways of thinking and being, the first monstrous struggle of thought and feeling, locked in a death struggle for supremacy, the strange delusions of which uh, there are still traces today. And in the midst of these, like a magician standing as sorcerer over all this world of fantasy and magic, the necromancy, ruled the strange deity, Anlil. This being, as the word Lil in the name implies, means demon. And the word Lilith, in relation to the story of Adam and his demon wife, implies not only a monstrous or evil creature, but by the demon a dream, a nightmare, a strange and horrible fantasy. And Anil became the symbol of this subjective psychic life of man, inwardly breeding monsters, even as the elos or the material slime gave birth to monstrous forms. Thus incredible creatures, creatures having no true substance in reality, have their inner life issuing from the subconscious slime of the invisible world and the forms, the strange patterns of the laws which were sometimes to generate bodies and bring them forth in order and propriety. These laws, not yet having been established, forms grew in strange and fantastic and incredible ways. Now in this combination of things, we also see certain traces of our own psychology. We say it's a terrible thing to imagine or even try to think of a world ruled over by these seething, incredible reptilian bird creatures that represented ungoverned and uncontrolled form. But let us see how quickly the same thing can happen in the mental life of the individual. When man is unable to control his mental emotional forces within his nature, he produces terrible fantasy, morbid dreams, monsters, of which the incubus is but a good example. Man fills his invisible life with nightmares the moment he loses his rational integration. So the Chaldean may not have been so wrong when he implied that if man relaxing the control of his mental and emotional life becomes the plaything of monstrous intensities, so in all probabilities these monstrous intensities preceded the establishment of control. 
and that at some time man was struggling for the integration of his own egoic consciousness just as nature was struggling to discover the laws by which its own formal development could be brought under order and integration. So in the beginning, there was this tremendous struggle for integration, a struggle that went on and on, according to the old story, for vast periods of time, a struggle in which these monstrous forms uh, reached out but could not survive, that they possessed no power of order within themselves, and that if they had remained as they were, the world would have gone on and on and on forever, and there would have been no growth, no consciousness, no integrity established in the entire structure of the world. Now, as time passed, and these two processes, one subjective and the other objective, continued, we find a gradual unfoldment of theology. We find the gradual recognition or the establishment of the need for an integrated concept of being. In this great struggle, something had to take over, something had to become the leader, because these two forces, equally differ differentiated, would have struggled forever, ending only in chaos. Then it was, according to the Chaldean concept, that the, the ancient ones, the mysterious ones who had gone before, gods of an older order, are supposed to have uh, come in and taken over and made these things uh, gradually take shape. And in among and uh, dominant with these gods came the deity Ea. Now Ea was the old one, very ancient, and Ea represented uh, not the element of air, don't, uh, that isn't it, uh, the deity's name is E apostrophe A, and it represents a very ancient being, a being that is supposed to have lived silently and eternally in space. Now perhaps if we study psychologically again, we can get some uh, concept of what might have occurred or how they, the ancient believed it occurred. Out of the struggle of man in infancy uh, to gradually integrate a mental and emotional being this struggle gradually seems to lead to something. <laughs> For in the development of things, a consciousness which has been locked behind the struggle gradually emerges, takes over, and integrates the mystery. This consciousness taking over from within seems to impose upon the great diffusion of chaotic forces a kind of law and order, and to demonstrate or prove that, re that residing inevitably in being itself is also the experience of its own integration, and that when this struggle, when this slime of the ooze produces a certain degree of fantasy, Gradually, this fantasy leads to its own awakening. Just as man, under psychotic pressure, is ultimately pressed on to the restoration of his own integrity. The restoration of law and order within consciousness is first recognized as necessary, as the opposite to the existing chaos. 
and gradually it comes into manifestation. In any event, Ea was the deity who first of all dreamt and envisioned uh, the organization of the world and who bound uh, the subconscious faculties of man into the service of an ancient principle that had always existed. In other words, the emergence from total consciousness, or as we might call it, the total unconscious, was in two waves or manifesting cycles. First, a chaotic, in which a psychic form, the seeds of thought and emotion structure, were, were projected. Then from this unconscious there also came the power of directional will, which ensouled both mind and emotions and brought them into order. At the same time, in the material world, the riot of forms which had resulted from the lack of control, this riot of forms gradually took a total picture, producing out of its own internal and eternal nature a terrible monster which was called the dragon. So here we have a God ruling supreme over the universe. And we have the dragon, a strange, horrible monster, consisting of the total integration of chaos in matter. For all of the strivings and the madness of chaos, had also finally come into a kind of mass or a kind of common unity. And this unity was the primordial being against which the great Saint George must go to slay the dragon of chaos. So the problem of the establishment of the adversary, the evil power, came in the integration of the concept of the dragon. And this dragon, Tiawa, ab abode in the depths of things and remained constantly howling against law and order, against the gods and insisted upon its own unconditioned, uncontrolled existence. Now the deity, Ea, then called upon the gods to go and reason with the dragon and to cause the dragon to renounce its authority and to become once more a servant of good. In other words, the gods were sent out to attempt to arbitrate uh, with natural phenomena in an effort to bring matter and mind into agreement. That matter might accept the controlling power of mind-will and that the divine imagination and reason might begin the molding of the material substances into the forms suitable for the incarnations of the godlings. But the dragon merely howled and refused to be in any way controlled. And so we have an interesting problem. If you remember in Genesis, day and night were created before the sun and moon, which is a peculiar circumstance. But the gods in the Chaldean and Babylonian account occupy the same position exactly. Ea, or day, was created before the sun. And the dragon, night, became its adversary. Now the dragon 
is always more or less guarding the sunset, which is, of course, the goal of the Nibelo. And in the Nordic mysteries and in practically all the religions of the world, there is a dragon. And this power represents night with its dangers and its hazards, and sleep during which imagination and the psychic energies of man escape from the control of the reason. So in the daytime, man began to be a reasonable creature, but at night, his psychic life possessed him, and he entered a state of madness. And in the old records, this problem of day and night is so clearly and wonderfully set forth that its psychological implications are very obvious. In any event, however, Ea, the deity, uh, was unable to reason with uh, this monster, this horrible creature that is usually represented in Babylonian art as a lion-headed, winged human being with a ferocious and terrible appearance and uh, often in mortal combat with the gods. So the deity who was at the root of life, the great thought which was organizing space, caused to emerge from his own being, as in the Greek myth, another god who is generally referred to in the Babylonian story as Merodach. And this goes back to your Hindu, your Chinese, and your Tibetan concept, which is in the reverse of ours. Because in the Babylonian also, the thought gives birth to the mind. It is not the mind that gives birth to the thought. Thought precedes mind in the Babylonian Genesis. But out of the great thought comes forth the hero mind, and Merodach arises sometimes as Baal, sometimes as Beos, sometimes as Dagon in the Philistine form, and sometimes as Oannes the fishman. But this Merodach is the only begotten of his father, the God who is destined and foreordained to bring order out of chaos. So he represents the symbol of universal mind, it's coming into the middle distance between the above and the below. In the ancient Babylonian art inscriptions, for in those days, they carved their cuneiform glyph directly across their pictures so that the body of deities and all these forms are covered with the little cuneiform characters. But in this writing and symbolism, we see Merodach descending into a middle distance between the abyss of space and the abyss of matter. And here standing in a luminous mist, wielding a so great blazing sword of light, the sword Notung, the sword Excalibur, the mysterious sword of quick detachment of the Indian fable. And with this tremendous power, Merida, blazing with celestial splendor, overcomes and destroys the dragon of darkness. And after the dragon of darkness has been slain, Ea, the god, rewards Merodach by making him the creator of the world we know. Now this is interesting because it indicates that creation, as we know it, is an entirely secondary process, and that Merodach becomes, so to say, the Logos, 
in the same way that Zeus, the Greek Zeus, or the Latin Jupiter, becomes the creator of the inferior order of beings. In any event, Merodach, receiving power and authority from Ea, and therefore being entrusted with all things and all virtues and all natures, proceeds to take the body of the slain dragon and from this body to fashion the entire structure of the mundane world. This is like the material universe formed or fashioned from the body of the snow giant Ema in the Scandinavian rites. Or in the Greek, after Zeus has destroyed the twelve titans with his thunderbolts, he fashions from the ashes of the titans and the blood of Dionysus uh, the human race. Now the titanic or primordial forces of the ancient Greeks are equivalent, uh, are equivalent to the zodiac. And the great dragon coiled in space was the Babylonian equivalent of the zodiac. Even as we find in Central America the signs of the star groups placed upon the back of the serpent in the case of the calendar stone. So from the body of this monstrous creature. Mind, working upon matter, produces organized existence. And this organized existence is stationed in a kind of middle distance between the extremes of life and matter. And therefore, actually, Merodach is entitled to be called the formator, or the cosmocrator of the world. He is not the creator in the true sense because he does not create something from nothing. He is the formator because he brings cosmos out of chaos by making use of the elements that have always been there. So out of all the primordial elements the world is produced and the world is divided into three essential parts. The lowest of these parts is physical nature itself, which begins to take proper form and kind, and the monsters disappear, and the horrible creatures vanish away, and those that had many heads and so on are no more to be seen, and the earth began to produce gentle bodies and types of forms that were suitable to the uses of mind. And these were originally called the mind-born forms, for they were generations of thought. In the meantime also, in the higher or mysterious subconscious chaos, an equivalent transformation was taking place. The dream world of nightmare and fantasy was vanishing under the light that shone from Merodach. And in the subconscious life of living things, mind began to take order. Reason began to assume power. Thought dominated fear. And man was no longer unable to face the mystery of darkness and of sleep. Mind began to give him the courage uh, to organize, revise his own fantasies. So Merodach then turned upon the sleep monsters, the mysterious beings in space, and he slew all the evil gods in space. He slew, therefore, the forms of fear, the hideous and terrible representations of imagination, of fantasy, and of guilt. He took all these horrible monsters of our dreamings and destroyed them because the moment the mind integrated or became organized, it determined the nature of sleep phenomena. And man's sleep phenomena became merely reflective of his waking consciousness. 
And, uh, of course, certain evil powers still remain, for the adversary is ever present. But Merodach took the world of sleep away from fear and gave it to reason. And by degrees, therefore, the reasonable world came into existence. But strangely enough, we find in Merodach uh, a, a new dimension coming in, because this is the god who kills himself and still lives, who tortures himself but cannot die, and who has an internal and an eternal existence apart from his external and temporal one. In order to achieve his purpose, Merodach decapitates himself. He cuts off his own head, and he then takes the blood that pours from the severed arteries, he mingles it with the forms that he has fashioned out of the body of the dragon. And therefore, having placed his own nature within these forms, he supplies in this way a link with his own spiritual source. For having received into themselves the blood of the God, the forms are then capable of being ensouled, and the deities come down across the road of blood, or the road of the first sacrifice, and take upon themselves these bodies, and thus it is that men or mankind comes into existence. For mankind comes in as the result of mind being locked in body by a mystery of sacrifice. In this point also, we have to go into the Babylonian theology and their system of mysteries which were developed at a considerably later date. For we observe then in this concept that mind uh, is immersed or absorbed in body or that life and reason, like the Dionysus of the Greeks, is sacrificed in order that humanity may come into existence. To make possible, therefore, the individualization of mankind, universal mind and reason, becomes, become buried or absorbed into form, and thereby increase this form, giving it an indwelling rationality, and setting up in the middle distances between spirit and matter the great world of form over which mind rules supreme. Form is matter plus organization or archetype, and all forms are compounds, and compounds are only possible because mind holds together. Uh, the elements or substances of matter. If therefore in death the conscious being is separated from the body, the body disintegrates because it is the dweller in the body that maintains and preserves the compound. This compound is form and forms are therefore embodied uh, are ensouled bodies for wherever there is a body that is ensouled, it is a compound of life and matter. And as such, it has an internal existence in eternity and an external existence in time. The internal existence uh, in eternity is derived from the god Ea. The temporal existence uh, in time is derived from the sacrifice of Merodach. And in the combination of these two, we have the beginning of the Babylonian concept of the nature of man himself, and why man gradually becomes the master of and conqueror of the world. For out of the form principle emerges the hero, of the world. This then brings us to a point in the Babylonian cosmogony, and now we have to pause and go back 
and strike a second stream because there were two streams of this as I told you one of which ends or terminates in the broken tablets in which Merodach has brought forth and organized his kingdom and has become the archetype of the ruler the archetype of the egoic self that is born of the compound of time and eternity of this and abyss of life and death the story of how all this happened the ancient records that go back to the very earliest period are said to have been given to the people of this region region by Oannes the fishman or the Dagon the mysterious being who came out of the sea and who is certainly and definitely a form of Baal Maradoc this being however carries with it certain other mysterious attributes the sea as we have already suggested here is one of the attributes of this being Ea because Ea was not only the creator god but primordially a water deity uh, the mysterious waters of space the Shamayim of the ancient Hebrew the waters which were above the firmament of Genesis were the waters from which Ea came now Oannes comes out of the sea also and here we must study once more the nature of water in the symbolism of these people water is the symbol of generation as we said before it is the symbol also of imagination because it is ruled by sin which a capital S which is not a vice but is the name of the Babylonian moon god <laughs> and this deity is the, is the controller of the waters of the earth sin and the moon and perhaps sin and imagination may have curious relationships to each other even in our more modern way of thinking <coughs> but Oannes comes out of the sea and he comes with the body of a fish the great fish and he is covered with scales and beneath the head of the fish is a human face and the head of the fish is above it forming what we commonly know as the bishop's mitre and the bishop's mitre is also the fish head because of its association in Christianity Oannes or Dagon never eats while upon the land remains upon the land all day and goes back to the sea every night this wonderful deity or wonderful being was the one who brought forth the civilization of these people he gave them the great rudiments of culture he taught them all things and then every night returned to the sea and he would never take any part in any earthy thing and he would never reveal his true identity to anyone he simply told them that they were his chosen people and that he was there to give them the rudiments of knowledge so he taught them reading and writing and mathematics and architecture and husbandry and chemistry and medicine and law he taught them astronomy and how to judge the seasons he gave them a priesthood and a theology and he was a psychopomp or a lord of souls and after he had given them all wisdom and all knowledge he returned to the sea leaving behind him a priesthood which was to carry on his rites and his mysteries now this Dagon who comes out of the great water of imagination out of the great mystery is of course the eternal teacher 
the mysterious guardian, the great and eternal ancient, which does certainly come out of man's own inner life. Now the Babylonians associated the appearance of this deity with day, and that when night came he retired again to the sea. So he obviously becomes a symbol of certain rational attributes of man, which function during the daytime and become quiescent or return to the unknown at night. So this hero, this great guardian of all things, like Persephone who spends half her time in the underworld and half in the world of light, is one of the numerous equations and symbols to represent a part of human egoism. That part which objectively integrates worlds and subjectively disappears into its own cause in sleep. So Oannes becomes the symbol of the teacher, another phase of the emergence of self. But in the beginning he came from the great sea, which has to be the human unconscious. And is another example of man's source of knowledge arising from the subtle, invisible, and mysterious parts of his own subjective nature. Now this being also established the mysteries and gave to the people a version of the story of Merodach and the dragon. And this being taught them that they were to keep its rules and keep its laws and keep its covenants, and that in the fullness of time, in the last great day, this being would return and would again rule over his people unto everlastingness and that this would be the restoration of the golden age and the fulfillment of all good things. This can only and must only be interpreted to represent the gradual restoration of total consciousness in man and its ultimate re-establishment as the controlling power in human life. Now religion was set up among the Babylonians as a means of doing honor and of keeping the laws given by Oannes or Dagon. And in the ritual, the God was called upon and asked to help his people, to be available to them, to protect them and preserve them from their enemies, to give them the necessary laws and prepare them for the day of his own return. Now let us think a little tiny bit about this also. Because we have a priesthood established for the purpose of serving this invisible and unknown deity who had returned to the sea. And when we understand the purposes and meanings of the ancient priesthood and their ritualistic dramas, their instructions and all of their teachings, we find that they were the custodians of processes and methods of human development and discipline very similar to the yogic exercises of India. In other words, they were the custodians of a science of the release of the divine in man. This can only mean that it was through such release that they served Dagon or Oannes and that this Oannes represented the power in man which had to be released that through the service of this and obedience to the laws of this power, man gradually came to understand it. And when he released it fully through himself, the second coming or the avatar had occurred, and the individual had entered into the golden age of conscious identification with his own spiritual nature. Uh, there is every obvious evidence in the myth that these facts and these principles were very well known to the Babylonian peoples. The goddess Ishtar occupies a very interesting and important relation uh, to this entire cycle. Like most comparative religious groups, the Babylonians had various deities ruling over different cities. And uh, as time went on, these community deities uh, gained separate mythological identity became mixed and involved together, like in Greece, where 
Pallas Athena became the patroness of Athens and so on. And the different deities were worshipped in their cities and had their own priesthoods. But there were certain common agreements among them and Merodach, under one of the other of his names, was almost universally venerated. The goddess Ishtar, whose, literally, whose name literally means a star or constellational brilliance, was originally, apparently, a war goddess. Uh, she was much associated with military activity and was armed like Pallas Athena. In many respects, she is similar to Athena because she represents also the higher or intuitive or feminine aspect of mind or reason on its intuitional basis. Ishtar occurs late in the mythological uh, story of these people in her descent into the underworld to rescue Tammuz, her beloved lover who had uh, died and had been taken to the underworld. And it was her desire to rescue him and bring him forth again into light, almost a reversal of the Orpheus and Eurydice cycle in Greece and the uh, Pluto and Persephone. Because in the case of the Babylonian, it was the hero and not the heroine who had descended into the underworld. Ishtar, to rescue uh, Tammuz, passes through the seven gates that leads downward to the abode of sin or the god of the moon and death. And here, deprived of her royal robes and adornments, uh, she seeks to achieve the restoration of Tammuz to bring him back again to the, uh, to the upper world. Unfortunately, the records of the fable are incomplete. The outcome is not known. Obviously, the fable belonged to the initiation rituals and therefore was not committed in its fullness to writing, much as in the case of Isis wandering the earth in search of the dismembered body of Osiris her lord. Ishtar becomes again now a symbol of the psychic life of man and again is involved in this mystery of creation. For we have now three different levels or three different stories that are important to us. One is the creation of the universe by the power of Merodach. The second is the creation of of man primarily and the unfoldment of man's life through the through parts of the Merodach story and the Oani cycle. And the third is the mystery of the human soul uh, represented in the myth or legend of Ishtar. So man, spirit, mind and soul or spirit, body and soul is involved in these three great cycles of mythology. The Babylonians also recognized the soul equation in their religious teaching and were among the first to set forth this uh, concept almost exactly as it later occurs in the religious writings of the Semitic peoples. For in this concept, the soul which is rescued represents something that is brought into existence and which is first of all sacrificed uh, for uh, the good of the ego or the self and later becomes the redeemer of it. So the psychic life of man is first of all his internal life which restores his external life and also the soul is actually the experience which man has inwardly accumulated. Experience is something that nothing can be stolen except through the long and difficult process of growth. Therefore the soul cannot be given to man, it must be earned. But the soul, in turn, becomes the redeemer of the personality. 
and Ishtar descending through the seven gates representing the seven sensory levels of man and the seven degrees of material existence finally rescues man from materialism which is the symbol of death so man's psychic nature gradually created within him as explained in the early test in the old testament in the creation of eve the psychic life of man becomes his redeemer and uh, like Pallas Athena is born fully armed from the head of Zeus for the whole evolutionary process of man is the perfection of qualities within his consciousness qualities which gradually come to have an existence of their own so in the Babylonian and in the Greek and to a great degree in the Chinese where it is a very commonly taught doctrine we find the creation of the alchemical homunculus or the artificial human being the positive polarity of the negative concept of the Frankenstein now man has always played with the idea of manufacturing or creating artificial beings he had toyed with the concept that sometime he could create life he doesn't know it but this is a psychic statement of a fact man does create life because man as a living creature is creating his own soul which is an artificial living thing to which he is capable of bestowing life when he bestows life he plays the part of Merodach where he gives of himself to preserve or protect the life of his own soul this of course is preserved in the, in the era of chivalry in the legends of the knight going forth to defend the damsel in distress and if necessary giving his life to protect her honor and each human being at one time in his evolution must give his life to protect the honor of his soul this is because the psychic life within him is the alchemical product which all other things uh, are involved in the perfection of and the completion of its uh, part in man's nature thus we have it as the philosopher's stone in alchemy the stone that is produced from the blending of the three mysteries of salt sulfur and mercury salt in this particular case is Ishtar sulfur in this particular case represents the gods or the great spiritual power which is Merodach and Mercury is again the messenger of the gods Zoroanes the fish man uh, because Mercury is also Votan or Odin and Mercury is always the teacher the messenger of the gods Mercury is therefore the solvent likewise in the nature of man the soul is born out of experience it has its abode in the psychic life of the individual man prior to the integration of consciousness like the fabled Adam had a demon wife Lilith that represents the soul of chaos in other words the psychic experience of chaos the negative soul in growth and development this soul is gradually transformed and from it in time as from Mary of Magdala are cast forth the seven demons and the seven demons are found in the description of the Pymander of Hermes also and the seven levels of purification in which the soul has to pass and here we have the seven cardinal virtues and the seven deadly sins of theology for these sins refer to the negative powers of the soul through experience therefore the soul or psychic life of man is the magnificent result of individuality individuality in itself is of no merit man can go on forever being wiser and wiser but he'll never get anywhere because the mere fulfillment of all of these material things will never bring the conclusion of life man does not grow simply by experience 
but experience makes growth possible. Growth results from contemplation of experience, from the uniting of an inner and outer receptivity. Through the soul, man begins to develop characteristics and character. And we have character as morality and as ethics, both individual and collective, as the result of the gradual release of soul power. And this soul power becomes, as it were, the saving grace. And out of the soul, according to the Chinese, is ultimately formed the transcendent being, who is, of course, to become the ultimate body of man. Because ultimately, man's physical body will no longer be his instrument. He will function in a soul structure or an experienced body resulting from the gradual generation of psychic life within himself until his psychic life is strong enough to sustain him and he will function in that rather than in a material body. The constant increasing intensity of man's psychic life is therefore more and more important and noticeable. And the restoration of this psychic life, the rescuing of it from appetites and desires, all this is very important. And all this is contain, contained symbolically in the story of how these deities come into existence and how once they are created, they then turn and become the preservers and saviors of the creation itself. So Tammuz as the personality or the mortality in man must be redeemed by Ishtar, who must descend through the seven worlds and rescue man from the limitation of his own mortality and return him again uh, to the level of the divine world or the divine experience from which he came. This is done through spiritual growth or that which is caused to grow or the spiritual inner conviction life of man which becomes ultimately his teacher and is of course another form of the goddess Isis becomes his legitimate and proper mistress whom he serves as the troubadour served his beloved. And this is also the beloved of the dervish and the Sufi mystic, the symbol of the psychic life within man which must be served, which must ultimately become the leader of life. And this philosophy all developed in the area around the valley of the Euphrates and has had a very heavy part to play in the, in the thinking of these people for a very, very long time. Now, in the, the general concept, then, let's try to uh, briefly, if we can, organize some of this pattern in terms of comparative creation myths in order to get some kind of an integration that we can remember and carry from one level of circumstance to another. First, then, all creation myths begin with the uncreated. And this uncreate, according to the nature of the myths, exists in one of three kinds or qualities. This uncreate can be matter. And the universe can be an emergence by generation from matter. The uncreate can be mind. And as mind, the universe becomes the extension of this mental energy into various conditions. Modern man looking for a creative solution uh, which is non-theological has hit upon the concept of universal mind. But universal mind uh, as a, a cosmic fact can be the second level or layer from which a creation can emerge. The third and highest is universal spirit which assumes a divine nature. Those who believe that the universe emerged from a universal spirit are essentially theologians. Those who believe that it began in a universal reason or a universal mind or a universal thought are essentially philosophers. Those who believe that it originated in a universal substance or energy are essentially scientists. Now in the older accounts, uh, especially one like the Babylonian, the creation takes place on all three levels. So that all three theories are essentially true but not complete. 
because there is a threefold creation that must be brought forth. There must be a creation of form, a creation of life, and a creation of mind. The creation of life in the sense of its manifestation uh, opens the Babylonian theory. Eternal life is not create, but the manifestation of life is. So the objectification of life as a spiritual force at the root of existences uh, becomes the beginning of the ancient concept. The emergence of a universal matter, a form, a polarity of this. Uh, life opposed as absolute activity by absolute inertia. The absolute dynamic and static, light and darkness, life and death as polarities were envisioned by most ancient peoples, and certainly were by the Babylonians. So uh, the universal manifestation of life resulted in a universal generation on the level of matter. Spirit and matter both grow, and they grow because of laws inherent within them. The life, of the growth of spirit is emergence. In other words, spirit grows by emerging, by moving from an unmanifest to a manifest condition. And as according to the Gnostic emanationism, the moment the life or spirit begins to move, there is a corresponding reaction from matter below. If spirit makes one step downward, matter makes one step upward. Every motion of spirit results in a reaction in matter, because this motion becomes the absolute law of matter, and matter must inevitably abide by the motion of life. So whatever qualitative or quantitative motion, especially qualitative, life makes, form or matter must answer. Thus when life is chaotic, matter is chaotic. Uh, when life integrates, matter integrates. And by degrees, these two, operating upon each other, cause a descent of life and an ascent of matter. The ascent of matter results in the individualization of monsters. Because matter, like body, as the Greeks pointed out, has its own intelligence, but it is purely and completely a material or survival intelligence. Body without consciousness has certain life intelligence within it, but that life intelligence is much lower and inadequate uh, to the rational needs of man. Therefore, the law of matter in the creation of structure is merely uh, to grow to mere growth without moral reaction. Growth without control led to the great monsters and even to the prehistoric creatures like the dinosaur and the megatherium and all the uh, brontosaurs and things that we remember or hear about in the stories of ancient times, even on a scientific level. But these forms run riot were due to the lack of the principle of conscious control. And the moment forms come under the control of reason, they diminish in size and begin to integrate. Now as life descending reached a certain point, and matter ascending reached a certain point, these two simple substances had to meet. And they met through the manifestation of the deity who represents always the second Logos. And the second Logos is always between the extremes and is always crucified between the opposites because its great purpose is mediation. Its great problem is the reconciling of things, as in the case of Mercury, which must absorb the two opposite elements to create the Philosopher's Stone. So the central deity is always messianic. In the Greek triad, the one, the beautiful, and the good. 
The one, of course, is spirit, the good is matter, and the beautiful, which is art, is soul, or mind, or the combination of these. And as beauty must bring order and harmony, and has virtue and integrity as elements of its own composition, so that which is created in strength is perfected in beauty. And the three great pillars of the house are wisdom, strength, and beauty. Uh, the alchemist said, art perfects nature. Beauty is art. The supreme art is human regeneration. But art is always a growth or a learning for the purpose of the service of the beautiful. And in the uh, philosophical worlds, man becomes the handmaiden or the artist who helps nature to perfect its own works. Thus art, beauty, psyche, or the soul comes in between and becomes the reconciler, the redeemer, or the sacrificer. Now wherever uh, mind enters into the compound, or wherever form is compounded, uh, we have a loss of values. We have this loss of values in the same way then we have a second theology when Meridoth comes along, or a, a still another theology when Oannes appears, and still another level of theology when Ishtar appears. Because all of these compoundings in the nature and structure of substances result in various obscurations and uh, bring in new levels of function and attainment. When the universal reason or mind or the universal Sota, the Messiah, takes upon itself the problem of, rec of reconciling spirit and matter in the creation of form, or in the equilibrium or balancing of form. It therefore sacrifices itself. It is immersed or buried in form. It takes upon itself the body of the world. It is crucified. It dies, and from its blood comes the salvation of men. So from the blood of Merodach was created the possibility of man's better way of life. Merodach, of course, appears again as Oannes, the teacher. And later the cycle is perfected by Ishtar, the soul, because all teaching must lead to the development of the soul nature. And uh, the soul becomes the internal teacher. It is the teacher which speaks from experience or from the gradual accumulation of psychic life within man. The chemistry, then, of Merodach, or the hero self, sacrificing as the Messiah its own nature and becoming immersed in matter, produces man's power to become a creating psychic being capable of molding, regenerating, perfecting its own nature. It is no longer left as an instrument of the gods because the gods have now taken up their abode within it. And the indwelling god makes man capable of the god experience in himself. So Maradoc's sacrifice was necessary like that of Dionysus in order that man might have within himself the spark of divinity by which alone he could ever know divinity. So man becomes the tool the holy sepulchre of this mysterious martyred God. And this martyred God, buried in the sepulchre of the body, as Plato so well points out, the body is the sepulchre of the soul, becomes Tammuz, buried in the seventh layer of the underworld, from which he must be rescued by his own soul, or by the soul power of nature. Now the soul power of nature is manifested through the seven arts, through the entire development of man's conscious life, for all of his conscious effort, his effort at growth, his em effort at empire building, his effort at uh, perfecting his own nature, his desire to be good, to be beautiful, to be strong, to be wise, all of these are the psychic power within him, leading him on to the rescue of his own buried self. So that the psychic emergency of sorrow, pain, stress, all of this is part of the power which relieves or releases man from the sepulchre of his own ignorance or mortality. 
through the psychic life man is building the bridge or the ladder which leads him back again to his own spiritual origin. The laws of this way, of this path, were given by Oannes, or by a further reappearance of the Messiah, who must not only inhabit and take up life, but must also give the teaching by which this life can be released. So the service of the mysteries, as they were practiced, uh, these uh, mysteries were dedicated to the restoration and resurrection of the dying God. And of course we have in this story another example of the dying God symbolism. Now in modern time, in modern thinking, is there anything here that means much to us? Or are these myths truly only dated fragments of an ancient time? I think they mean a great deal to us because mythology is an eternal record of man's psychic life. And in, by mythology, man is always and forever seeking to explain himself. Just as he has never been able to find, literally and physically, a good explanation for how the universe came into being, he doesn't have easily available any good explanation for why he came into being, or how he came into being, or what he came into being to do. He must therefore always face this mythological mystery which is nothing more or less than the effort to solve instinctively the problem of his own existence. And in the Babylonian or in any other system, we have a splendid opportunity uh, to become aware of our own subjective lives and what these lives may mean to us. Obviously, we came out of our own subjective. Obviously, all of these systems are egocentric. They begin with man. They begin with man's reaction to that from which he came and to that to which he came. Man, in the poem, you know, came out of the everywhere into the here. Very mysterious. A charming statement but requiring considerable commentary. Man also finds himself in the here and primitive man, as we can imagine from surviving uh, documentary, documentary evidence and artifacts, lived in a chaos which he knew very little about. So he lived in a universe that was too big for him and frightened him to death from the first moment he was in it. So he came from the unknown and he lived in the unknown. And he was confronted with, a, with two problems. Orientation to the outside world which he had just entered an orientation to an inside world which he knew nothing about. He was therefore truly crucified between the two unknowns. He has been that way ever since. But technically man today is still in much of a dilemma as to what's inside of him and what it means, what is outside of him and what it means. He is unable to balance or achieve an equilibrium between internal and external. And, of course, the only possibility of achieving this equilibrium is through this integration which he calls selfhood. Now, in Buddhism, we know that the self is not an eternal thing, but the self is a focal point. And ourselves, or the ego as we know it today, is the living testimony of the equilibrium we have attained between the internal and the external. We have built civilizations, we have created worlds, we have gone to school, we have done many things, we have invented and devised. And it is all as the result of gradually coming to equilibrium in the middle distance between the two unknowns. But today we are not sure what direction we are supposed to go. We are not sure of the direction from which we have come. All we know is that there is a tremendous potential inside of us and behind us. There is also a tremendous reactive outside of us and around us. Little by little, we are beginning to realize that this outside reactive is due almost exclusively to the internal pressure. And that creation is therefore a motion from the internal parts of things and this motion setting up the objective reaction so that we come to the point of emanationism 
which I think has great psychological importance. When man internally steps down one step, the universe outside of him steps up one step to meet him. Any change that occurs within him must immediately produce a corresponding modification in his entire environment. So that if man, in the search for understanding, descends that he may experience, matter ascends and releases experience, or gives to him that which it contains, and which is really only a mirror. Because matter is forever mirroring the individual who is behind and invisible. Man cannot see himself because he does not possess the direct power of looking in. The only way man can see himself, as Bacon pointed out, is to hold the mirror of nature before his face. Then he sees his reflection, but he cannot see his actual nature. So he has to depend upon knowing himself through the reflection of himself upon his environment. Now this environment is the chaos, and in this environment also is the dragon who has to be slain. And man is the dragon slayer who must overcome this chaos. But he must recognize that the chaos on the outside is only a symbol of the chaos on the inside. And what we call evil is nothing but the reflection of immaturity. It is lack of adequate integration within. Any negative thing which we see around us is due to an undeveloped power within our natures. And any divine and positive thing that we see is due to an objectified power within our own natures which has been brought to maturity or at least to a reasonable degree of growth. The entire theory of creation as it is developed in this great cycle of probably 30 or 40 nations is therefore this struggle in which man ultimately achieves his true position as master of the polarities by simply recognizing that the external is nothing but the shadow of his own immaturity. Therefore, that he must cure the external by correcting the internal. And that the moment he integrates inwardly, the material pattern falls into its proper place. Thus the involutionary program is that in which life gradually descends into a state of obscurity. Evolution is man's release of this life from obscurity and matter to the restatement of its own essential nature. And this release, this evolutionary process, is nothing more or less than ideation. It is not man actually climbing up. It is man building psychic or soul power within himself which causes the world around him to change from a material to a psychic thing. Evolution is the power of man's soul over his environment. And whatever change or transition occurs in the psychic life, the material environment takes its place. A good example of that is the very simple fact that as soon as man is a self-governing creature inside, we will have peace in the world as far as politics are concerned. Because politics, again, is nothing but the lengthening shadow of man. This is a large composite thing. But in imagination, in psychic life, in psychotherapy, in all the illusions and delusions which burden the individual, in every degree of these things, we have the same cosmological scheme of the conquest of illusion by reality, the slaying of the dragon, or the integrated normal power of the psychic life, victorious over chaos. And every individual who is not ordered is living in a chaos. And the only way that he can bring cosmos out of this chaos is to restore or rescue his own internal, which he does by following the rituals of the mysteries and by learning through uh, the study of the creation cycle how he and his problem came into existence.
But once he has discovered the nature of the problem, he is already well on the way toward its solution. And we will take up some other phases of the solution as we go along.